Bernie Madoff, the financier. Bernie Madoff, what are you going to say something to the victim? Mastermind behind the biggest Ponzi scheme in history. Bernie Madoff. Bernie Madoff has been arrested. They think it's a story about one man. Bernie Madoff, Wall Street monster. Bernie Madoff, the financial serial killer who built the biggest Ponzi scheme to date. This man's actions were so horrific, none of his family members wanted his ashes after he died. In an industry running on scam, it's always good to remember, if something looks too good to be true, it most likely is. Watch till the end to see how Madoff built the biggest scam to date and how it finally came crashing down. Beginning of Bernie Madoff Bernie Madoff, an average kid born to Jewish immigrants living in the suburbs of Queens. The time Madoff was born into was colored with a desperate desire to peaceful and idyllic suburban living. In the Madoff family, this dream shattered when Madoff's father's business adventures failed and his mother had to help support the family. This shattered dream left an everlasting impact on Madoff as he decided he'd not become a failure like his father. In 1960, Madoff married his high school sweetheart, Ruth, the woman of his life. With his wife's help, Madoff established his company Bernie L. Madoff Investment Securities, or BLMIS for short, in his father-in-law's company. His first business adventure took him to sell over-the-counter stocks, the kind of stocks that are not sold in the New York stock market and have potential for huge profit or loss. Madoff had stone-cold nerves from the very beginning, which helped him garner success in his business. This success led him to open an unofficial financial advisory business, which his father-in-law aided by dumping huge amounts of money gathered from investors for Madoff to invest. Madoff took huge risks in shady shares in his advisory business, which blew up in his face when the market crashed in May 1962. He ended up losing $30,000 of investor money, but instead of coming clean and facing the mistakes, he borrowed the money from his father-in-law Sal Alpern to pay back the investors, making it look like he had not lost a dime in the middle of a market crash. In the 1970s, Madoff decided to leave Alpern's company and move his own businesses to a building at 110 Wall Street. This was happening at the same time computers entered the game, which made trading much faster. A trade could be done in three days instead of a week. These changes boosted Madoff's business, and while his legit trading business was growing, so did his illegal financial advisory business. Around this time, Saul Alpern retired. He nominated Avellino and Bienes to take over the company. These greedy men wasted no time to take advantage of Madoff's illegal advisory business. They gathered money from their clients for Madoff to invest. These customers must have had a huge trust in them as they refused to even share who is the man responsible for investing their money. It's possible these people did not question their advisors as Madoff seemed to do no losses. Who wouldn't want to invest in a bulletproof option? Madoff, of course, was actually never investing any of the money. He just found new investors to make it seem like he was making profit. Typical Ponzi scheme in which you take money from one person to pay back another. In the center of Madoff's Ponzi scheme were so-called Big Four. Norman Levy, Carl Shapiro, Stanley Chase, and Jeffrey Pickauer, rich investors flooding Madoff with money. These rich men were not in it to take advantage of a no-loss hedge fund run by Madoff. And Pickauer, for example, ended investing $600 million. But he also withdrew huge amounts out, raking in massive profits. Madoff's family lived off of the money investors poured into his hedge fund, which meant at the end of the 70s, the Madoff family was living a dream of owning an estate in Palm Springs, multiple boats, and a membership to a country club. The Dance with SEC in 1992, SEC, United States Securities and Exchange Commission, caught wind of a risk-free hedge fund, which alerted them to look into Madoff's business, as in investing, there is no such thing as risk-free. To shake them off, Madoff's first-hand man, Frank DiPascali, created fake bank statements and other documents of transactions that never happened. SEC closed the case, as they put it, who would fake such a thing? Do you think the SEC should have caught Madoff at this point? Comment below your thoughts. When Madoff moved his business to 3rd Avenue Glass Building, his legal trade business took place on the 19th floor. His illegal advisory business operated on the 17th floor. 
Madoff made sure there was no communication between these floors and blocked even his own sons from entering the 17th floor and kept them strictly working on the 19th floor operations. This, of course, was a way to keep his sons clean while Madoff was gathering money through feeder funds, such as the one Thierry Villachet created with the money of European royalty. To gain the money from royalty can be done with a reputation such as the one Madoff manages to muster through the seeming success he was making. This trust made him handle 5-7% to of the New York stock market in the 1990s. The key to his success was his incredibly simple strategy of gaslighting anyone doubting the legitimacy of his hedge fund. If an investor wanted to pull their money out or questioned the time it took for them to get documents, Madoff would simply say, If you've got all questions, maybe you should pull your money out, cause I don't have time for this. He also reminded them if they left, they could never come back. In the early 2000s, the dot-com bubble burst, and while the stock market was sinking once again, Madoff's hedge fund kept making profit. Another financial company's workers, Frank Casey and Harry Markopoulos, looked into Madoff's business as their supervisors demanded to copy his bulletproof technique. With a quick look, the guys realized Madoff was running a Ponzi scheme. Casey and Markopoulos decided to send reports demonstrating all red flags showing Madoff's business was fraud. But even with all the evidence in front of them, SEC did not see it. It was only after an article published by Michael Okrant about Madoff's illegal activities that the SEC realized they were questioning the man about not registering his hedge fund. Madoff, as always, had an answer ready. I don't have one. And the SEC backed off once again. This dance between people trying to push the SEC to see what Madoff was doing and Madoff gaslighting them into turning a blind eye kept going for years. Madoff was close to being caught. After Markopoulos had pushed them for five years, the SEC asked Madoff to be questioned. Madoff cooperated and provided the SEC with bank details for them to check out his hedge fund account holding all the money he supposedly was making. If only the SEC had checked that bank account, they would have seen that Madoff was lying about all of it, but instead, they took his word for it. The Crash and Bloody Aftermath Madoff had gotten away with multiple checks from the SEC and two market crashes, but the 2008 stock market crash finally took him. As everyone wanted their money out, and even the most loyal investors like Pickhauer refused to put more money in, Madoff realized the end was here. As a last effort, he tried to write off checks with the last 300 million he had. This money was meant to be distributed to people like the most loyal investors and his family members. This effort was stopped, however, when his sons confronted him saying how ridiculous it was in a crisis like this to be handing out money. Being backed to a corner by his own sons, Madoff had no choice but to tell them and his wife Ruth what was actually going on. When Madoff had come clean, his sons Mark and Andy were so shocked and disgusted they stormed out the door and ended up turning their father in. When the FBI came to arrest Madoff, he did not resist. Instead, he confessed to everything, determined to maintain he was the only one knowing of 17th floor operations. As the news of his arrest broke, people were furious as many ended up losing everything. What really caught people's anger was the incapability of the SEC to catch Madoff even when the evidence was shoved in their face. Three days after Madoff had been arrested, Villachet killed himself as he realized his business had burned to ashes due to his blind faith in Madoff. For the financial destruction Madoff had caused, he was sentenced to 150 years in prison and the FBI seized all of his assets, including all property he owned, making his wife Ruth broke and homeless, just like many people that invested in Madoff's business. Madoff died in prison at the age of 48, with no interest from his sons to take his ashes as they were still disgusted by their father's actions. The hate Madoff's sons faced from the public crushed Mark, who killed himself at the age of 46. Madoff's younger son Andy, who died of cancer at the age of 46, said, My father's sins killed Mark quickly and me slowly. The financial destruction and anxiety Madoff's actions cost are the biggest in history. Do you believe no one else knew what was really going on? Comment below and take part in the conversation. If you enjoyed our video, be sure to like this video and follow us for more awesome content at Quality Mainstream.